Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, plenary session uh, sponsored by uh, the European Observatory uh, and ASPA. Uh, my name is John Middleton. I'm the uh, president of ASPA, the Schools of Public Health in the European region. Uh, and in the first uh, brief part of this session, uh, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, announce the uh, winner of our uh, Andrea Stamper medal this year. Uh, that is uh, something we award every year, and uh, this year goes to Professor uh, Gitano Farah. Uh, Professor Farah is uh, Emeritus Professor of Public Health from Sapienza University uh, School of Public Health in Rome, uh, has had an illustrious career in uh, vaccinology and uh, en environmental health. He's served at national and WHO level. Uh, he's worked on health and uh, social care uh, research and evaluation. Uh, and in 1976, he was uh, the uh, chair, the president of the epidemiological committee uh, looking into the uh, Cervezo chemical disaster uh, and subsequently worked on the um, international committee for that work. So it is my great pleasure uh, to uh, present this medal, the Andrea Stamper Medal, uh, to Gitano Farah. And, and now it's my pleasure to invite Professor Farah to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to get the first slide. Anyway, uh, it's a great honor for me to receive the Andres Stamper Medal being a member of the Italian public health community, I feel that the medal came also in recognition of the good job done by the main Italian <clears throat> professionals, both in the university and in the many levels of the National Health Service, who in the recent and less recent years worked hard to grant our country a modern public health. The beginning of this process can be established in the year 1945, when Augusto Giovanardi, a very prominent hygienist, proposed the complete reform of our health organization, inspired by William Beveridge, but with the original idea of distributing the responsibilities among the states, the regions, and the local authorities. The discussion went on for many years until 1978 when the Italian National Health Service was born carrying a strong accent on prevention. I had the chance to be one of the last pupils of Augusto Giovanardi and once he returned to Italy after two years at the Ann Arbor School of Public Health in the USA, I was immediately involved one after the other in three moments of research and actions that helped me grow in the field of my choice. At the beginning, in the 60s, the final fight against poliomyelitis with a mass campaign of the saving vaccine that began in 1964. Se excuse me, uh, 64. Giovanardi and Sabin were close friends and they are shown together in this slide. This national effort quickly reduced many thousands of cases of disease to a few cases a year, and the last one was diagnosed in, in 1982. I remember that I was the first Italian volunteer to get the drops of seven vaccine in 1962. And in 2001, Having become the president of the National Polio Surveillance Committee, I attended the ceremony in Copenhagen when Europe was certified as polio-free. Another 
series of experience came in 1976 when the Vezo accident took place. Our institute in Milan was involved in the epidemiological surveillance of the fear health consequences, and I participated in the decision to evacuate many thousand people from the most polluted areas before beginning the contamination. For all that period, as already said the president, I was the coordinator of the regional epidemiological committee and later the secretary of the international steering committee. The Seveso problem took years before its solution, but the final results were positive and offered the basis for the European Union to issue the Seveso directives. Finally, having been involved in the tuning job of the health reform, my engagement was to do research and to contribute directly to the project of the new prevention departments that have been established in every local health trust, concentrating into a unitarian body all the activities of prevention. But a much more important defy has been the transfer of the formation of the non-medical health workforce from local institutions such as hospitals or regional schools to the universities. The original diplomas were transformed into a three-year university degree, Laurea Brevis, uh, which offered the basic professional preparation and may be spent as such on the world market. Then the first degree owners can attend the two years of the second level, Laurea Magistralis, offered to those interested in research, management, and teaching activities. Public health is included in class four, sorry, in class four, oh boy, there was a problem. Class four, prevention professionals, uh, with two figures, the health visitor and the technician for prevention in living, occupational, and veterinary fields, a brand new figure of polyvalent technician. We must remember that in Italy, veterinarians belong to the Ministry of Health because they are th there to protect human, not only animal health. So, I can reach my conclusions saying just simply that. My path in public health could combine three different experiences, infectious diseases and vaccinations, environment, health organization, all connected together by a common thread of epidemiology. I hope that all the young people who approach public health could leave experiences of that kind terribly demanding, but so rewarding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Farah. Congratulations for your great achievements. And it's fascinating how many of the points of the career of Professor Farah are so present and important and will be core of our presentations today, vaccinations, skill mix, health systems. My name is Joseph Figueras. Uh, I'm director of the European Observatory, who together with ASFER, we are very pleased and privileged to organize this plenary session for you. What is this session about? It's second parts. So they say second parts are never good, so we'll try. It's the same plot. Uh, it's the same theme, but a different plot. So it's bridging towards the future of public health in Europe, future bridging, but trying to focus on can and how we ensure health in all EU policies. <laughs> health in all policies is not new, we all know that. Uh, but we have to acknowledge, do we recognize that the EU, the Commission, is a health in all policies organization par excellence? 
in addition to its health policy has a direct impact on health, some in this room would say perhaps not powerful enough, there are enormous, powerful instruments in other directorates, across directorates, that have a major impact on health. And major policy levers that we need to be aware of. But again, why we're bringing that today? We are into a new cycle, it's been said that earlier. We heard already from Anne Boucher uh, some of the new priorities. During that cycle, that this, starting this new cycle, there was a lot of debate, not only of whether Sante would disappear or not, and it's wonderful to have Sante here, but also there was a lot of debate as to how we can influence health in other ways across directorates. Obviously, a second theme linking also with yesterday is the SDGs. SDGs being adopted at the core of EU policy. The question is how? How is that going to take place? But clearly, the commitment is there, uh, not only in terms of the principles of SDGs, but also in terms of the financial mechanisms. Uh, the president of the Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, was saying to refocus the European semester to make sure we stay on track with our SDGs. This, if it happens, is a major good news for all of us in this room. And also, it's been said earlier, and I want to link it with that, uh, the economy of well-being. The economy of well-being. Well-being is in the treaties. The EU is about well-being. Well-being is core to health, as we know from the WHO definition of health. But now, the theme is that well-being is good for development, is good for the economy. We've been saying that for a while as well, but we need to seem to now have some of the instruments to do that. So do I dare to say that perhaps we are in a window of opportunity? And in this window of opportunity, what we aim to do today with you is to have perhaps a better understanding of the process. How can we influence the process? What are the policy levers? And in particular, what you can do, what we, the public health community, our national organizations, our NGOs, can do in this field? Or are we going to conclude that this is too far away, therefore there's nothing we can do about it? So let me therefore now open the Mentimeter. I will be a bit more rigorous than where yesterday, no regards to your moms, no complaints about the food, and there's no complaint, the food was excellent. But I'll ask you please, in this Mentimeter that we're opening now, to contribute with no moaning, not saying public health, they forget us, no one cares about us, the European Union doesn't care, it's vested interest, but try to find contributive, positive ways in which we can contribute this process. In some ways, and this is a stereotype, it's not what the EU can do for you, what you can do for the EU, so we, they have an impact on the health of those populations to you, we are accountable. And in this Mentimeter contributions, we'll have the newsroom. We have Dorley Carr Godleaf. She's the Secretary General of Gastein, the European Health Forum Gastein, a sister organization who has had in its core very much these kinds of issues. We addressed those many, many years, in many, many occasions. And Naomi Nathan, a, a young leadership person from whom we are learning an awful lot, a fellow at ASFER. They're going to be the newsroom and try to bring together the very excellent contributions we are going to get from you. We're going to do the following. We're going to get two keynotes. I'll introduce Anne Boucher first. He's been introduced already, uh, Director General in Santé. Santé, beyond the public health mandate, they have a public health mandate across all directorates. And I think, Anne, if I can call you that way, you are a, a, a health in all policies uh, person. <laughs> You're a health in all policies person because in addition to being director now in DG Sante, you work in ECFIN, you've been very much at the core of regulation, you work in employment, you work in taxation, you work in IT, in, in, in information society, so you really know very well how you can manage all these others and the difficulties and the possibilities of working with all these other directorates. But we, we ask Anne Boucher, and I'm very grateful Anne for that, is to give us a peek of a clear contribution that has to be core to your work, which is the European uh, country health profiles that the, 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 the European Commission is leading. I say a peak because they're not official, are embargoed, they're coming out next week, 
But Anne has been generous to give us a sense of what's coming out and the usefulness of what's coming out because that could be a very important instrument to get its health in all EU policies, both abroad EU and particularly from member states. Anne. Thank you, Josep. I mean, this morning I had the opportunity to highlight that we are now in a transition towards a new mandate for the next five years where ambitions for health have been raised uh, very highly and um, it is against uh, important mega trends of uh, climate change, uh, pop I mean population aging, uh, increasing uh, hybrid threats, uh, increasing inequalities and these are things which have a health dimension and we need those to respond to these challenges and for us it's very important that when we respond to this we do it on the basis of evidence-based policy and to do evidence-based policy you need to collect and organize the evidence and the way we have decided to do it is in a way which allows us to uh, have the possibility of getting overviews of the hottest uh, issues and challenges and, and at the same time we need to have a regular, solid, comprehensive benchmarking and reporting to understand what member states are doing. And that's exactly what the state of health in the EU uh, is doing. It is uh, as uh, Joseph said, it's a joint undertaking of the European Commission, the OECD, and the uh, Observatory. And uh, it, it is uh, spread uh, over several, uh, several years. And it is, has now, it is well established uh, over the last five years. And it puts together expertise, it's put together information and, and uh, comparisons. And what I, I mean, as Josep was saying, we are on the 28th of November, we're going to come out with the country uh, profiles. So we're going to publish 30 country profiles, which are systematically reviewing the performance of the health systems uh, for the countries, benchmarking them. So it's uh, very useful. It's very updated on what has happened as trends uh, in the uh, different member countries. And we have, together with this cycle, uh, with these uh, 30 country profiles, we have what we call the companion report. And the companion report is exactly what we need to zoom in and, and to, have, uh, to help us uh, formulate our policies and policy responses. Uh, so I will give you a cop uh, I mean some uh, previews of the conclusions of the companion report and, um, and you will see that it links a lot to the five priorities which I have mentioned uh, for the mandate uh, of, of the new commission. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, on vaccination where we address the issue of vaccine hesitancy and the big concerns of the member states that we are leading in, in vaccine hesitancy and that um, it is uh, in this area we have, I mean, the evidence and comparing countries, we can, I mean, really highlight the fact that improving health literacy and countering disinformation, uh, working actively with health workers is really the way uh, forward. And, and some of you might be aware that we have this uh, uh, vaccine coalition here. Um, the second aspect is the uh, digital transformation. Uh, we definitely see uh, that we are at a critical moment for the takeoff of the digital transformation. We think that the digital transformation, and it comes out when we look at what's coming up with the apps, with the wearable technology, with the online fora, and also, also with the data mining and artificial intelligence, is that there's a huge transformative potential, but at the same time, uh, there are a number of um, risks and there are, therefore it's very important that digital transformation um, happens with a good oversight of its implementation and with safeguards wherever possible. And what we have identified in our analysis there is that there are some areas uh, where these oversights and these safeguards should happen at the European level. So one of the issues is uh, interoperability, the other one is privacy issues related to security and safety are also at stake. 
The third issue is the uh, accessibility uh, to healthcare. I mean, we, we're all aware that, I mean, our model of uh, universal access to health is challenged in many ways. And uh, we see a number of gaps in healthcare accessibility in the different countries. It's really a reality. But uh, we do not have a good way of measuring this. And we do not have a good way of measuring this because the uh, data uh, are, are very poor quality. And so we, can, we underestimate uh, the, uh, the, the problems in accessibility. And I think one of the big challenges which we highlight in the report is that we need to uh, deal both uh, with the... Uh, we need to combine clinical and socioeconomic characteristics to be able to really uh, assess the uh, gaps in healthcare because clinical and social uh, vulnerability, they go hand in hand, and it is uh, really problematic that the statistics do not allow us to do that properly right now. Um, a fourth uh, topic uh, which we are addressing in the companion report is the skill mix innovations, um, and we see that happening with cases, for instance, like tax uh, shifting, which uh, is a great potential uh, for the health system resilience. And in particular, for instance, it helps address uh, shortages uh, in medical staff. And we have seen uh, interesting ex experiences on the role of nurses or pharmacists. But we are all aware that, I mean, uh, such uh, tax task uh, shifting can only happen with a proper um, reform of the organization and of the professional norms. So it has to be really supported by, uh, by adequate uh, education and training. And the uh, fifth topic um, which is uh, addressed is the issue of uh, affordability and accessibility of, of medicines. It's, I, as I have mentioned it this morning, this is a very important new priority uh, for the EU uh, agenda, which is, um, I mean, the fact that a lot of countries do not have access to innovative medicines and therapies. Uh, they are only marketed in the, um, in the richer countries. And we also have the issue of shortages of the uh, more classical uh, medicines. And for this, I mean, we think that the way forwards and I, is the... Um, health technology assessment. It's very important also to, uh, that there's more cooperation and transparency and sharing of experience between member states on pricing and procurement policies. Uh, there's also, um, I mean, the unexploited um, benefits of using more generics and biosimilars. And um, it's also important to have uh, sound governance principles in uh, the appropriate use of, of medicines in ho hospital settings. Yeah. So these are, in a nutshell, the uh, conclusions of the companion report. As I said, we're going to launch all this as a package with the 30 country profiles on the 28th of November. They will be then widely available. They will be, I mean, we will have a lot of outreach uh, uh, op I mean, actions uh, in the member states to stimulate discussions. For us, I mean, the 30 uh, reports uh, are, are important because they fit the European semester process. So they help us identifying in which areas member states uh, really need to, um, re I mean, in which direction they need to reform the health systems. And really, this is material which is not only useful for us, but which is available for, I would say, any uh, policy analysis. So I hope in your own areas you can, you can use it, you can, and also you will find it useful and informative, and you'll be, you'll be also participating to dissemination and also to provoke some policy discussions uh, in the different parts of the uh, public health and other policies. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed for uh, this taste, uh, Anne. Um, the exciting thing as well is the numbers are there. The numbers are there for the Union, but they're for individual countries. It's an enormous tool for you to advocate to get some these priorities and many others in your own country situation. It's interesting, Anne, that when we launched that, we're all worried about the benchmarking. How did, would the member states 
accept the commission benchmarking. I mean, it's unacceptable. We are in a, uh, in a confidential group here, but it's fascinating how there were no complaints. Member states, I remember when we presented that to the Council of Ministers, wasn't a single complaint about it. They all found very useful when the benchmarking is done consciously, critically, with very clear limitations, uh, it's been very, very well accepted. One very important point uh, for this community, two things. One is the voluntary exchanges. So the Commission is going to work with the member states, with you, to debate those results and use it as a basis for change. This is not just academic. And number two, we really want your feedback. It's supposed to be your tool, respecting and which has been pushing, putting a lot of pressure to her staff, to the OECD and us, on getting better on the indicators, on the infographics, on the analysis. So we need you, please, uh, to, to do that and help us with that. Now I'd like to, we'll go back to one with some more debate in a minute. But first I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Scott Greer. If you want to take the rostrum, uh, Scott. Uh, he is Professor of Policy and Management at the University of Michigan. But I think we can call you an European, uh, uh, Scott. You are, you've done seminal work really in areas of governance, in health and all policies, in EU law. Therefore, you're ideal to answer the question, what are the policy levers? And actually, let me add you a surprise question. Can they, can they here contribute these policy levers or are they too far from, from where they are, these policy levers there at the European Union and the Commission? The restroom is yours. It's not a policy lever if it doesn't affect real people and the work that they do. So, the State of Health in the European Union Companion Report is a wonderful guide to the challenges and the opportunities that we face. And I'm very grateful to the Observatory and ASFER for the Commission for being up here, and also to the wonderful collaborators who made this book possible, because I couldn't possibly know all of this. But one thing we learned from doing the book is that if you think about how to attack these challenges, an obvious thing to do is to look up public health in the European treaties that shape the European Union, that are basically its constitution. And you can go look up public health and you'll find Article 168. And if you read Article 168, you find that it is a gate that can be opened to enable all sorts of action, coordination, complementarity, support. It is full of words that do two things. One thing that they do is they enable Europe to act when health ministers want it to. Another thing is that it blocks European action when health ministers don't want to see anything done under the public health title, under the mandate of public health. It is a gate. It is a well-built, solid gate. It is well-oiled. It opens smoothly when you want to open it. It closes solidly when you want to keep it closed. There's only one flaw in this beautiful gate. There's no fence. The history of European Union public health policy is occasionally about valuable uses of Article 168 in issues from blood products to the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, but there's also an enormous range of ways to bypass the gate, of ways that the European Union shapes health and shapes health policy, often for better, sometimes not so much for better, without relying primarily on public health on Article 168. Agricultural policy was both the origin of many of the first European health initiatives. It still has a role in issues like food safety, and obviously the food system has a huge influence on our lives. Competition for the management of health systems, trade, international trade agreements shape health in many different ways, the European semester, there's lots of different European policy areas that bypass Article 168 and only rely on it loosely. This can be seen as a problem, or this can be seen as a wonderful set of opportunities. You'll be glad to know that you're not supposed to be able to read this slide, which we did for the book. There's only one takeaway you need, which is that there's a lot of boxes. On the rows, we have the different functions of public health systems, the essential public health operations WHO identified. And beneath it, the domains of health systems. And then in the columns, we have all the different relevant European policy areas. And what you see is that far beyond 
Article 168 or a project that you see know of. There's so many ways the EU shapes public health. Did you know that Euratom shows a role in three different dimensions of public health and health systems? That's the Atomic and Radiological Nuclear Treaty. So this is a map of a tremendously diverse range of things that Nick Fahey put together, which show us so many places where there's an European impact, and that means we can have a European impact. To highlight that, if you look at the European treaties, and all of the language of European politics is couched in terms of the treaties that authorize action, there's actually four treaty bases that specifically mention health, Article 168, public health, but there's also labor, in social policy, labor regulation, health is an objective. In the environmental policy treaty articles, health is of humans is an objective, and in consumer protection. That's already a set of opportunities. Those are explicit mandates to promote health in Europe. Then, there's overall commitments by the European Union. In Article 9, the Union shall take into account the protection of human health as one of its core objectives. There's sustainable development goals that President von der Leyen has signed up to, including for the semester. There's the pillar of social rights, which was agreed by the Council, the Parliament, the European institutions, and it's a list of 20 core social rights of Europeans, which is a normative document, but also a statement of commitments that the member states, the European institutions, and their leaders have made. And finally, there's the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is effectively a constitutional document, which among other things includes access to health as a right, a fundamental right. And we see the effects. Fiscal governance, five years ago, when we wrote the first edition of the book, was basically an austerity measure. It was driven by finance ministries and DG ECFIN. It didn't show a lot of evidence of a subtle understanding of health, and it showed, as we would predict from any policies made in the depths of the debt crisis, a real focus on a fairly narrow concept of austerity. Compare it today. Strong, subtle, state of health in the EU informed, supporting improvement of healthcare quality, improvement of access and equity in a variety of different countries, from Cyprus to Italy, from Lithuania to the Republic of Ireland. The fiscal governance mechanism that was in so many ways born in what appeared to be a necessary commitment to austerity is now a support for improvement and expansion of health services and equity. And that's not new. There's a lot of European policies that don't necessarily sound good that turn out to be good. There's the healthy side of the internal market. An enormous amount of EU law is fundamentally based on internal market clauses. That's the nature of the EU. And that includes a lot of really good regulation. That includes pharmaceutical safety, medical devices safety, many, many regulations, my health workforce, which actually make the European Union a better and safer place to live. In the United States, automobile safety is defined as the safety of the people inside the automobile. So you can kill all the pedestrians you want. If you're fine, it's a safe car. In Europe, the safety of people outside the vehicle is part of the definition of a safe car. That's European internal market law, and there's surely thousands and thousands of Europeans who are alive today because of it. So our conclusion analytically is that there is and there will always be European policy affecting health. You can't make policy about car safety and sustainable agriculture and climate change and workplace health and safety without influencing health policies and health outcomes. The question in European politics is always whether it's made for health, whether food policy is made for health or for agribusiness, whether labor policy is made for health or for employers' narrow interests. But there's a lot of opportunities because of that diversity, because there's so many different ways to make that happen. The first edition of our book in 2014 wasn't particularly happy. One of the pleasant surprises of writing this edition was the sheer number of things we found where there's potential, where there's a real opportunity starting in 2019 to take advantage of institutional renewal and drive more European policies in ways that are good for health. And there's a lot of them. Thank you.
Thank you. Second, uh, Scott, uh, I think you're leaving uh, the Star Wars, the Star Wars image here. I hope it's not the dark side of the European Union, but uh, <laughs> the positive side of the European Union in terms of the impact it can have on health. Uh, very well, because you managed in very few minutes to give us a real, a real, real nuanced view of all the possibilities. I'd like to have you with me a second, because what we're going to do now is ask you to vote to exercise to right to vote, and please do help here, do vote. We're going to put the same Star Wars themes there, and we're going to ask you to, be, to sit in the seat of Anne Boucher. Anne Boucher, in addition to Santé, plays a key role for this dark or less dark side of the European Union. We're giving you 100 points. 100 points means political resources, and which are important in the EU, I guess, <laughs> managerial uh, capacity with your staff, financial resources, regulatory elements, to invest, divide between these different areas. It's a bit of a painful process, but we'd like you to think through, and if you don't, if you're not able to allocate them, it means that you do not understand very well what's going on and where the impact on health is. So please, humor us and make us a favor and try, you go into Mentimeter, oh, people are doing that, only one person, well, fine, two. Okay, see where we get 10% of the people here. Uh, let's influence the audience. What would be your favorite, uh, Scott, as we are sitting here? I think I gave the game away that internal market regulation, it's the strongest European Union power and it goes into so many places. It goes into car safety, it goes into the training of medical professionals. It goes into the safety of our products. What about, about the European pillar of social rights and SDGs? We're also excited in this field. Is there any real tools, financial mechanisms, regulation for this to really happen? Or is it just one of these principles that we all love to see? Ah, the thing about principles that we all love to see is that they authorize action and they authorize people who want to stop bad action. So the structural funds are partly conditioned by compliance with the semester and the goals of the semester now include the SDGs. This is tremendous. Five years ago, it was an austerity policy. Today, the sustainable development goals are the goals of the European Union in its fiscal governance structure. And behind fiscal governance, there's real money. Excellent. We'll go back in a second to Anne to expand a bit more. Uh, she knows the structure and the system extremely well. So what's happening with the voting here? It's like Eurovision, you know? Sustainable development goals, 19 points. Okay, let's go. That's like a race. Let's a race, you know? We got the European pillar of social rights very high. While this is happening, and I hope you keep voting, in a minute we'll open again the, the Mentimeter for more contributions about what you can do, what we can do as public health profession. And let me introduce to Marianne Harkin. Marianne Harkin is our ideal member of parliament here, because she's not in the parliament anymore, but she was in the parliament, so she can talk even more freely now. Marion was a member of parliament. She's now leading this organization called All Policies for a Healthy Europe, another version of Health in All Policies. Uh, and she has obviously a lot of experience trying to pass these directives, pass these regulations, and working all across sectors within the parliament. I guess the first question to you, uh, Marion, is how does that look like? Is that, would you agree with that? Uh, is that uh, uh, your vote as well? Would you? Well, I suppose. If you were in parliament today, Everybody has their own perspective and because my main committee was employment and social affairs, the European pillar of social rights is way up there for me. And the reason that it's way up there is because I was able to see during the last term that we were able to put legislation in place to underpin that pillar, specific pieces of legislation around transparent and predictable working conditions, around work-life balance, around the European Labour Authority, etc. And for me as a politician, the nuts and bolts are really important. I like to see something that you can point to as a direct consequence of let's say in this case, the European pillar of social rights. It, sometimes we end up talking a lot about stuff, but for me, 
the, the meat and potatoes, as it were, is that we sit down and that we put flesh on the bones and we can say to citizens, this is the impact on your life of this piece of legislation. This is the impact on your health. Excellent. I guess it's terribly complicated to implement these things. I mean, uh, to go and bring health into that. Uh, can you give us a bit more of a sense how you get these directives through, how these commissions work, and, and what are the real tricks here to get, to, get, to get these directives through? Just before I answer that, can I say that Please. it is so encouraging to hear Anne here today and to know that we now have a commitment from the Commission and to hear what Scott is saying also. No pushback from the Council. The Finnish Council conclusions on the economy of, sorry, of well-being. I think there's time and tide, and I think now is the time. The economy of well-being and people's health is beginning to take centre stage in many member let me, states. Let me be devil's advocate, though. I've been involved very much with the presidency uh, as well on the economy of well-being. Can we sell the economy of well-being? Do, do your members of parliament colleagues buy it, that it is good for the economy? I think there is some selling still to be done. Sorry, I'm not sure what's happening. I think there's some selling still to be done. Um, not everybody is fully convinced. Uh, some member states are, are really moving forward on this and other countries. New Zealand, of course, is, yes. is leading the field and we can learn a lot. But, but looking at some of the uh, conclusions from the Finnish presidency, where, for example, they ask member states to consider putting uh, well-being indicators into their budgets. I mean, that's yes. a very specific Major. measure that they can take. So I think it's time and tide. I think everybody here should feel excited about the possibilities and the opportunities, both within the Commission and the Parliament. And one of the questions I had was how uh, can people, if you like, feel that they have an input into policy making, into policy decisions? And I think there is organizations have to look at that very carefully to see whether it's through the parliament or the commission that they can do that and just specifically specifically, specifically for <laughs> but it doesn't matter specifically we are going to ask you again to the mentimeter to bring your contributions your specific contributions what do you want from them if I were still in the Parliament, um, it's, I suppose you've got to look at the issues that, that you're concerned with. You've got to see what's happening in legis legislative files at that point in time. But I think more and more members are now open to listening what groups like you and organisations like you have to say. I mean, Scott mentioned the semester. You have no idea how difficult it was within the parliament to try to even get the term social indicators, never mind health, social indicators, you know, to be accepted as part of the semester process. And in a quite a short space of time, really four to five years, that has changed. So now there's an opportunity mm -hmm to input into decision-making at all levels. It, I don't have the time today to give specific examples, but if anybody wants to speak to me afterwards, whatever. On my microphone, yes. We'll be looking for you later on to, to, to do that. Uh, uh, let me remind you what you told me yesterday, uh, Marian. Uh, you were saying there's no point for people to come to call your office when actually the amendments have been put in. And sometimes the profession believe that uh, we put our evidence there, it will be taken on board. If we are not able to identify the wind of opportunity, there's no chance in the world. All of you, I know, are proactive, but you, you've got to be 
how can I put this? You, you've got to be really careful about how you do it because there is a particular process. And if you input at the wrong time in the process, it's a waste of your time and the person you're talking to. So it's really important for all European organizations to know how the process works from the very beginning, consultation with the commission, right down to the end of it, to the trialogues, to even lobbying your particular minister in your own member state on a particular issue. It's a very long process. Perfect. And just finally, I mean, for me as an MEP, I had two functions. Number one, legislative change, and number two, act as a conduit for ordinary citizens and NGOs to influence policy. There's many like me, use them. We, will, we wish that they're all like you. We are very impressed. Thank you very much, uh, Marian. John, John, Professor John Middleton is president of ASFER, a former president of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine, many years out there. You are the profession today for me, John. Do the profession understand that? Do the public health profession understand these processes, these mechanisms? Do they know how to act in there? Um, well, I think um, uh, there's a fairly rudimentary understanding of the workings of the European Union. Um, we've, uh, in my own case, I've only more recently started to understand some of it. Um, I would say, in, in, in part, answer to part of your question, though, do the profession understand uh, uh, what... Um, what the goals need to be and how to influence health. I would agree with the way the Mentimeter is going at the moment. The thing is, um, if, you've, if your policy is wrong, no amount of money will fix it. If your policy is right, you will find that money is not the biggest of the problems. So having sustainable development goals as the high lever on European policy uh, conference, I think, has got it right. And I'm watching the pillar of social rights creeping up. Uh, I think um, for all the reasons Scott's described, the internal market rules have been an extremely vital protection to our health. I would like to see the international trade law rise up the list because I think uh, the, that and the internal market regulation go together. So uh, I think, you know, conference is pretty on key where, where they want policy to go. I think the other great thing about um, the uh, commissioner-elects, uh, um, you know, Europe that strives for, strives for more, uh, the idea that the sustainable development goals should be part of that annual monitoring through the European semester, uh, vitally important. Um, and let's see the money go towards the things that we all think are important. Uh, let, me, let me push you further. Uh, you are asked for here as well. No. You've been doing, as for this, been taking the leadership in competencies, in yeah. new skills for public health. Are we doing enough no. for people to understand the political network, the political economy? Sure. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Sure. My voice is very powerful, so I can also, also scream. Uh, although my wife always complains, uh, and my children. No, the point being that uh, uh, the profession is, uh, you're training that profession, skill, uh, skills, uh, competencies. Are the schools of public health themselves understanding this? Are the schools of public health schools understanding the communication elements, the advocacy elements, teaching their professionals? Are we understanding the political economy of Marion here? You know, um, in ASFA, we've been working on the competencies for public health um, and the, the curriculum. Um, you know, there's some very uh, basic things that people in public health need to learn. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's a whole new field. People, um, somebody asked me what the language of public health was. Uh, I say it's partnership. Um, you've got to have enough of the jargon of different disciplines. Uh, you've got to be able to start a conversation uh, with the people in different disciplines. I've been talking to the architects from Italy here today. 
But are you an example? Yeah, are you an example of the rest of the... Well, I hope so. And, uh, you know, I, I an illustri illustrative example of the profession, I mean. <laughs> An illustrative example. You think that the profession is doing that? Talking to the police and the architects? It's doing it more than it was in the past. Excellent. And I think the thing about the, the 168 article is that the, uh, it's not just European government, it's not just uh, national government, it's local government. And certainly in, in, in the UK, that local involvement of uh, uh, different disciplines in public health is, is getting stronger, I think. Meanwhile, we have some silly people saying they like cake, thank you, and others that are trying to take this a bit more seriously and beginning to put forward some suggestions as to how we can make a difference from uh, the profession, from your organizations. What would be your prescription here? What would be your recommendation as how do these organizations can make a difference in, in this uh, health in all your policies? Yeah, well, um you know, we, as I say, we need to develop the networking and partnership ability and skills that people have. Um, that's very much part of what we're trying to do through schools of public health. Um, I, I tend to describe um, the health of the public, which is everybody's business, um, and very often not everybody does it. And, uh, but we need a, a skilled public health profession um, because we need that grit in the oyster or the uh, catalyst or the conductor of the orchestra, whichever analogy you like to make of it, because we can't do it all ourselves, uh, but we have to make the connections with people who can. And it, it's a real and undervalued skill. It, you know, we can all Thank learn you. about meningitis, but we can't learn about talking to other people. Indeed, we need to work on communication. Anne, can I come back to you? Uh, I noticed that the European semester was at the bottom. I was kind of disappointed because I do believe the European semester is perhaps one of the main tools. What can you tell us about the European semester as, as one of the tools to, to make a difference uh, in, in terms of health in, in other policies? I, I can understand. I was intrigued by the exercise of uh, the ranking and I couldn't give an answer. Uh, but I understand why European semester is not seen as the main tool. Uh, I think, I mean, internal market, it's hard decision, it's hard safety obligations. Uh, so uh, you can really promote health uh, through uh, legislation on product and services uh, safety standards. In the European semester, I think, and there was a comment about the Irish crisis here, which I find also interesting. It has raised uh, the issue of the organization of the health systems uh, on, in, on the overall agenda of, of economic policy. So, I mean, health uh, systems is now part of the really discussions uh, which take place among the economic uh, finance ministers, social ministers and health ministers. So, it's, uh, there's much more of a coordination. Um, I think, I mean, we, if you think of the role the state of health has played uh, is really to identify the direction of reforms and, and I mean, I think this year we had 16 countries which had uh, recommendations on the health systems, a lot of them to move in the direction of more prevention. Uh, public health, right, exactly. Yes, public health, uh, reducing uh, out-of-pocket payments and, and all these types of uh, proposals. Um, I think it, it has... The, the novelty also which we are introducing now is that there's this link between the recommendation and the funding. Because it's true that it has raised the profile of health, it has increased ownership of the health issues by different ministries, but we know from the recommendations that they're not always followed. So if you think in terms of effective influence, you might not always uh, get what you want compared to internal market legislation. But certainly now what we have is that when there is a recommendation on the health system, uh, the funding in the structural funds or uh, for technical assistance for structural reform is accompanying the recommendations. So you have a way of delivering the reform. So which, uh, the, they can, the, the semester can affect as well the use of the structural funds? Will, definitely. 
Because it's now... actually the second largest budget of the European Union. There's yes. this a constitutional symmetry, but in terms of funds, the real area is agriculture and structural funds, yes. isn't it? When we come out, yes, when we come out now with the recommendations, we have to have an investment plan which is uh, indicating uh, how the structural funds are going to be used to support the implementation of the recommendations. So that will enhance investment in the health systems at national level. And you would expect that two, three years down the road, you should have a higher part of the structural funds instead of paying roads and uh, railway tracks, which will start paying health systems. But at the same time, arguably, as we're talking health in all policies, Perhaps uh, these infrastructure developments or investments in other areas can have as much impact, if not more impact in health, no, than no, the definitely. building and the training. And I think that's the fascinating element of the structural funds. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are asking, and people are coming up with very, very good contributions, which in a minute uh, our newsroom should be ready to report back, uh, what would be your plea to uh, people in the room as to how can they help the Commission? We heard about how can they help the Parliament. We heard from John as well uh, with the Schools of Public Health. From the Commission, how can you use the public health profession? We heard earlier about UFA. Now from the various organizations, very diff uh, different people here in the room, mm -hmm. wh what would be your wish list of how you want them to be on board? I mean, my wish list is that uh, when, we, when we launch initiatives, uh, we manage to mobilize uh, interlocutors at the European level. It's much more difficult to get the multiplier effect in the member states. So for me, I mean, what I would uh, really expect I mean, like is uh, that we have a, a better connection between the national and the European level uh, when we organize stakeholder partnerships. Excellent. Thank you very much. Newsroom is not easy at all. I feel very bad to ask you now to summarize all these richness in one minute or two. I'll give you two. Yeah, well, definitely it's not easy. And uh, over the, okay, it works. <laughs> yeah, we have been receiving your contributions and we tried to cluster map them to give you back and I will start with uh, Dolly what do you think about the responses we have received so far okay thank you Naomi um, it's a very bright and very colorful array of things that have come in and as Giuseppe was saying it's a lot of the topics that are uh, also discussed in Gastein always so it shows also what the public health community is actually made of um, and it shows that we go from an MPH student asking what his or her contribution could be to the, I assume, more senior public health professional asking, um, why are we still talking? Why are we not, you know, long already in the acting phase? And, you know, we need to go beyond uh, the rhetoric. On the other hand, there's, there's a lot of support of what Anne was saying about benchmarking. Uh, there seems to be a real hunger for it, and uh, it should also be done uh, against the SDGs. And um, the EU is seen as doing benchmarking on behalf of the citizens. Uh, there's a need for more evaluation, more assessment, uh, measuring health indicators, and also uh, reaching a greater comparability of health systems. Yeah, I think also another addition was looking into the education and training aspects of things. There were a lot of comments which we clustered into education and training on how could schools of public health prepare public health professionals to understand health policy context, so imbibing health and health policies into curricula and also the whole discourse about cross-sectional uh, conversation and making them understand the skill mix, so bringing in different aspects into the curriculum and training helps uh, professionals more. There was also the thing about uh, maybe the results that we have seen from all our publication, putting them into the curriculum as well. Uh, another cluster we had was inequalities. and. Uh, Exactly, and also there a, a big array of, of subtopics, for example, not forgetting vulnerable groups and also not shying away from using uh, potentially different methods, new approaches. Um, also to address uh, the gender equality and uh, to address all of Europe. So we should think beyond the EU and we should not leave the young outside. So listen to the young voices in public health. Yeah, finally, before I hand over to you, Joseph, another striking one was about uh, 
putting social determinants of health into consideration because uh, the audience felt like social determinants of health was not mentioned and that's very important. And I think uh, one striking contribution we got was about European teamwork, so emphasizing uh, John's point on partnerships. So uh, we will be signing out from the newsroom and uh, back to you, Joseph, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. It does show, I'm going to study that in a lot of detail and should be available on the website, the diversity of what public health is about, apart from the cakes. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> views and <laughs> perspectives. One of them is why an American is talking about public health in yeah. Europe. I love that one. Yeah. Because yeah. why not to acknowledge, well, this American in particular have taught us, many Europeans for many years, an awful lot of health policy in Europe. And therefore, American Scott Greer, uh, expert in Europe, as well as many other expertise. How would you reflect on all that? In a minute, I'll ask you one line each, colleagues, to try to get some lessons back home on the session today. But I want to give a couple of minutes to Scott to react to all this session. Will your book be different next time round? I hope it continues getting happier. It will probably have fewer beautiful options, but that will be because some of the good options were taken. As an American, I think the one thing I can say is that the European Union doesn't look like its member states. It has a budget capped at 1% of gross national income of the European Union. Member states, 7, 8, 11%. That alone tells you how different the EU is from the member states whose politics we understand better and which do so much for us. And you saw that in the Mentimeter results. Policy objectives were much more popular than policy instruments. Policy instruments are boring and require lots and lots of technical background in an unfamiliar legal and conceptual language, but that's how you make the policy objectives real. That's how you make the pillar of social rights real. That's how you achieve the SDGs. And Ireland popped up justifiably because that's an example of how EU politics matters and can work. The response to the financial crisis, which got relabeled a debt crisis in Europe, was by any indicator, and there's lots of research, a tragedy for Ireland and for a number of other countries, a political tragedy foretold. One of the results of that was the institutionalization of the semester, which was a project to make fiscal governance permanently rigorous so there wouldn't be any more need for bailouts. And it was not designed with health and social objectives in mind. Fast forward five years, it's full of health and social objectives and it's going to incorporate the SDGs. That's a classic case of how political action turned something that was not good for public health into something that is increasingly useful and promising. So we don't have to defend what was happening to Ireland a decade ago in order to see the tremendous achievement and promise in the semester and other areas now. Perfect, thank you very much. Can I have one sentence from each to close that down? Okay. Public health is the best job in the world. Uh, it's not who your doctor is, it's who you vote for that most affects your health. So work with the politicians. Three sentences. Thank you. I saw a piece there about the skilled marketeers. Listen to me. You are the skilled marketeers, which are energy, which are enthusiasm and your knowledge. Yes, politicians are short term, but if you come up with something that matters to citizens, any of them worth their salt will listen to you. And finally, a piece from the UK. We will miss you if you leave us. We will miss you so much across so many different areas, but particularly in the area of public health. You did a lot of the heavy lifting and I hope somehow you manage to remain. Here, here. Last sentence from you, uh, Anne. I mean, for me, I mean, the, uh, we, I, I would like that for every challenge we manage to have a health partnership which goes beyond the public health constituency. That's my dream. Thank Thank you very much indeed. Well, my microphone will be able to move. Uh, from me, I noticed that uh, many of you were asking, what is the European semester? Well, you have a book out there. We financed many copies of that book that you can take and read and understand in more detail how these mechanisms operate and how can you use them. 
And the last sentence will come to that book. Uh, it's very short and I'll let you go for your coffee. The question is not whether we want an EU health policy. For EU health policy is inevitable, is there by default. The question is how it should be made and for what ends. And I add, what is your role on that EU health policy? So stop mourning, let's just stop mourning as public health. Today, for the first time, and thank you very much, we had an optimistic, forward-looking, constructive way to move forward with real mechanisms to make a difference. Thank you very much for your contributions and for being here today. Thank you.